our presentation today about health care for California's jail population. Um, first, a thank you to the James Irvine Foundation. The, this, this event and this lunch is part of the James Irvine Foundation briefing series that we do with a lot of our work during the year where we're able to present it to a, a public audience like this. Um, also, a couple of upcoming events. We have, um, we have a busy June, actually. Uh, next Tuesday, uh, in this same room, CSAC Conference Center, uh, we have an event about online learning in higher education. Uh, we have a report that came out about two weeks ago that looks especially at community colleges in California and uh, student outcomes from uh, online classes. And we'll have, a pan we'll have a presentation of that report and then a panel discussion uh, with representatives from all three segments in the higher education in California. Um, and then uh, later that week on Friday the 27th in this room also, we'll have a, a discussion about uh, recidivism and realignment. Uh, looking at uh, you know what's happened since uh, we shifted a whole bunch of inmate responsibility to the local level from the state level a couple years ago. Um, so with that, uh, there should be an evaluation form on your chairs. And uh, if you wanted to fill it out at the end of the event and tell us how you think we did and drop it off on the table on your way out, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Also, um, this is being broadcast, uh, so if you want to silence your cell phones, you might avoid an embarrassing moment. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, the slides from today are going to be online at our website, as well as the report that you're going to hear today, ppic.org. Um, and with that, let me introduce our presenter today. Uh, Mia Bird is a research fellow at PPIC. She's done a lot of work in the corrections area recently. Uh, such as funding formulas for uh, counties for realignment and some other work. Um, and today we're going to look at health care in, in the jail population. So please welcome uh, Mia Bird. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. We're really excited to talk more about this topic. Um, I'm here with my co author, Shannon McConville. She's sitting right in the front, like a good co author. Um, and Shannon brings a lot of expertise in the health fields. I have more expertise in corrections, so this is a true crossover project. Um, you know, just a moment about what got us interested in this issue. Shannon and I, about a year ago, began talking about the, this as an important crossover issue. So really thinking about the jail population and more broadly speaking, the correctional or criminal justice population, a population we know has very high health needs and is quite hard to reach, and then the potential under ACA to begin to reach that population in a better way is really what motivated us. Um, and then, soon after that, came AB 720. Uh, passed last fall. How many of you have heard of AB 720 or realize its passage? Okay. Um, and a law that we think will better facilitate the ability to enroll this population under ACA. So that's broadly speaking our context. The purpose of our paper today is to really take a first step or a first look at this issue in California. So we're taking advantage of the jail profile survey, which is collected by the Board of State and Community Corrections, and gives us a limited window, but still a very helpful window, into healthcare provision in California's jails. So we'll be presenting some of that data analysis today, just to kind of walk you through and assess the level of healthcare provision, and also what the trends look like over time over the past decade in California. And there's a lot of reasons you might expect things to be changing. One of the big ones would be public safety realignment. So we'll take a look at that. And then we're going to move into what we anticipate some impacts of ACA and AB 720 might be in the jail system. I'm going to talk about some ways that we think local systems might be able to reduce their correctional costs, which are a huge driver of General, or healthcare correctional costs, which are a huge driver of correctional costs in general, and also some ways that they might be able to improve public health and improve recidivism outcomes by taking advantage of this new legislation. So I've just given you a brief outline of what we have coming. So what really, one thing that really drew us into this issue is the high health needs of the jail-involved population. 
We have limited information in California about those needs, but we know drawing on the broader criminal justice literature that this population has very high rates of infectious disease, high rates of chronic conditions, both of which need management on a continual basis, um, but many of these individuals are getting sporadic care while they're in custody, we, we think, because they also face high rates of uninsurance. Um, this population also has large substance use dependence issues, we think, drawing on the broader literature, and also mental health challenges. We draw sort of from the national numbers that substance dependence is probably around two-thirds of the population and mental health issues around at least half. So if we can apply that to California jails and we hope to learn more in the future about the needs within our system, um, that's a pretty significant population that needs treatment. Unfortunately, this population has been quite hard to reach. Uh, one reason they're hard to reach is that they're predominantly young, male, and low income. And what this means is that traditional routes to enrollment are not as available to this group. So they're less likely to be enrolled through employers, they're less likely to be participating in higher education and accessing health care or health insurance through those means. So in reaching this population, we've really had a lot of limitations historically. Most of these individuals were not eligible for public coverage, and very few had access to affordable private coverage. So before we get into the changes that might may be brought by ACA and AB 720, we're going to take a little bit of time to discuss what the provision of care looks like in our jail system. Of course, we can't really address underlying need. We don't know the health characteristics of this population at an individual level, and so we can't look at how that varies across counties or over time. But what we can look at is the provision of care within the jail systems. And that's what we draw on the jail profile survey to determine. And what we find is actually quite interesting. So when we just look at how jail provision of health care works, we see a couple things. We see that some jail systems provide care directly, while others rely on contractors. So there is variation across the state. For those that rely on contract care, the setup of those arrangements also varies. So we have a system with a lot of variation at the local level, and we want to keep that in mind as we think about how things might change in the future under ACA and AB 720. Um, but we know that one thing is the same across these jail systems, that they are required to screen inmates when they come through the system, when they're booked into custody, and that they're required to provide necessary care. And are they reimbursed for this care? No. They are under an inmate exception. So public health insurance will not cover care received in custody unless that care is through a hospitalization, an inpatient hospitalization stay of longer than 24 hours. So the burden of providing this care really does fall at the local level, most of the cost of this care. Um, however, we know that people cycle in and out of custody, right? So they're receiving some care in custody. Potentially, they could also receive care when they're out of custody. So let's first talk about the care they're receiving in custody. So what we've done here is we've just pulled the year 2012, the most recent full year of data. And we've just tried to summarize across the state what's the level of provision of care. So this first column here is giving you the total for all jurisdictions in our data. Unfortunately, there were three jurisdictions that were unable to reliably report data, and so this is probably a little bit of an undercount for the state of California, but it does give you a strong sense of the level of care. So if we take all the different ways in which individuals receive health care and we put them all together into total health encounters in 2012, we're looking at about 2.3 million encounters within the jail system. Now, the types of encounters do vary in important ways. The largest category of encounters, sick calls, essentially means an inmate requests a visit with a medical professional. And that may be a triage nurse, that may be even a medical assistant, and that may lead to a doctor or physician appointment. And you can see the level of care through medical appointments, both on and off site, is much lower than these sick calls. So many sick calls are handled before they reach the stage of a physician appointment. 
And then we also see dental visits are an important category of care. I know that we've heard this anecdotally, and this just puts a number on the level of dental care that's being provided in the jail systems. What we've done to try to get a sense of how much care this is relative to other care providers throughout the state is we've broken this down into sort of a monthly average and then a monthly average per ADP. An ADP is a measure that's very special to the correctional setting. It's the average daily population, and it's very useful in population management in jail systems. So ADP is going to tell you, as a jail manager, how many beds you have full in a given year, right? So how many full year persons do you have? But from the perspective of health encounters, we know that that bed is not filled by the same person for the whole year. So there could be many people filling that bed, coming in and out of the system, and utilizing health care. So you might say that this is a very conservative way of thinking about the number of encounters per person. In fact, the Bureau of Justice Statistics estimates that about 16 times ADP represents the flow of individuals through a jail system. But that conservative estimate is about 2.4 encounters per ADP. And when we think about that in comparison to, say, other settings where this population receives care, one possible setting is to think about the about 1,000 health care clinics that exist where uninsured individuals can receive care. And when we look at the population, say males age 20 to 34, a very rough approximation of our jail population. But we do see about 0.67 visits per year. And if you think of visits to clinics as somewhat similar to medical appointments, we're looking at fairly similar numbers here, right? So when we combine on and off-site appointments, we get about 0.55 per ADP. So we can't draw a lot of concrete conclusions about what this level of care means, but I think the key conclusion we can draw is that there is a lot of care happening in the jail system. When we look more specifically at mental health needs, this is one of the categories that is captured in the jail profile survey. It's very helpful because we have limited information on mental health needs for California. We see numbers that are not that surprising when compared to national trends. We see that there are about 20, about 20% 20 of the jail population has an active mental health case. But you can also see at the bottom here the, new, the rate of new mental health cases. So about 15% of those cases are new in a given month. So that helps us to understand the flow that the jail system is dealing with. And of course, one question might be, well, that's 2012, but what's been happening over the last decade? We know there's been a lot of change in California corrections. So have we seen major changes in the provision of care? And although we have seen ADP grow in the jail system, so the jail population has grown, it does appear that health care provision has grown in step with the growth in the population, particularly in the last few years. We don't see any strong changes, we see pretty steady provision of care through the course of realignment. So having kind of summarized the level of care we're seeing in the jail system, we're now going to move into talking about what the impact of ACA and AB 720 might be for this population. So prior to ACA, most of this population was ineligible for public coverage and had a lot of barriers to accessing private insurance coverage. And what we see happening under ACA, because California adopted the Medi-Cal expansion, we see a huge increase in the eligibility of this population. And that's potentially a huge resource to support some of the health care that's needed by the jail population. And we know many in this population are cycling in and out of custody, at least in the short term. So we can think about continuous care as something that could also influence the cost of care while in custody. So this is important from the perspective of individuals who need care. This also may be important from the perspective of counties that are managing the burden of realignment, managing all the old burdens of their correctional system, and maybe looking for ways to create efficiency and to reduce costs and even to improve public health and safety outcomes.
One other thing the ACA did is it really expanded the coverage for substance dependence treatment and also mental illness. So under Medi-Cal, you have a much easier time now accessing that kind of treatment, having that kind of treatment covered. And this, of course, has implications for reentry services, which counties are largely funding now out of their own pockets. But potentially with expanded coverage, they could draw down resources and stretch the resources that they have locally much further. So what did AB 720 do? AB 720 was passed as a complement to ACA. And it did a few things that may seem small, but are actually quite important. One, it encouraged counties to designate an entity that would help those in custody to fill out and pursue applications for public insurance. It also allowed that entity to act on behalf of that individual in the case that that individual was hospitalized. So that means it enabled counties to really take action to get draw down Medi-Cal funds or Medicaid funds from the federal government to cover the hospital care. Granted, that's a small percentage of the jail population, but potentially a high cost share. Thirdly, it made a very important change to California law. Prior to ACA, when you entered jail custody, if you were one of the small number who had Medi-Cal insurance, that insurance was terminated. Post AB 720, it is merely suspended. And while you're in custody, while you don't receive federal funds to support your health care, when you leave custody, you can reinitiate that coverage rather than having to then go and pursue and initiate the process of enrolling again. And lastly, AB 720 clarified for workers within the county that fill out these applications and process them for individuals that they could continue to do so even if that individual was in custody. So we've talked a bit about the impact of these two new pieces of legislation, but we want to get into here what we think are the real opportunities for counties. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first, and potentially most motivating for counties, is the direct savings <clears throat> counties can hope to achieve through both coverage for inpatient hospital care and also support for reentry services. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we think it goes quite a bit beyond that. Um, we can think of infectious diseases and chronic conditions as health needs that really need to be managed on a continuous basis. And so to the extent that enrolling inmates or utilizing jails <clears throat> as sites of enrollment can help individuals to get continuous care, we may actually see the costs of providing care in the jail system decline. So if someone coming in has a well-managed condition, that condition may be much less costly to treat while they're in custody. Of course, People do leave custody, and they reenter their families and their communities. And so providing health care for this population through improved access to insurance could be really important in protecting families and communities, right, and improving their sort of public health, generally speaking. <laughs> Lastly, and this is something I've alluded to a bit, we know that there is just not one thing that we hear from the counties frequently is there's just not enough resources for reentry services, and particularly the substance use and mental health challenges are very hard to treat, and there's never enough providers, but also never enough resources to get people care. And so to the extent that we can <clears throat> address recidivism outcomes through, <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry, improved provision of reentry services, we can see counties potentially gaining there as well. However, as I'm sure you can imagine, we don't expect to see all counties just excited and ready to go in terms of taking advantage of AB 720. And there are a lot of good reasons. Um, many counties are still <clears throat> really struggling with the burden of realignment. They may lack the resources to initiate 
new programs that would facilitate enrollment for jail inmates or new programs that would help people to enroll in transition back to the community. They also may be set up in a way where they don't see significant cost savings. So the potential cost savings are going to really vary by county. And lastly, counties may have differing views about the priority to place on this population relative to other populations that are very high need. So do we focus efforts on enrolling the jail population or do we focus efforts elsewhere? So just in conclusion, the jail population we see as quite high need, but unfortunately quite hard to reach. And we see um, jail, jail systems throughout California providing a great deal of care for this population, comparable potentially to the care provided outside the jail system. And we see great opportunity under ACA and AB 720, both to reduce costs and also to expand access to care and improve public health and ideally to also reduce recidivism. <clears throat> and finally, we think enrollment efforts will vary quite a bit across counties, and that's actually a role that we see PPIC and the kind of research we do could play in helping counties to both share best practices and strategies, and also to better understand potential advantages of pursuing enrollment for their populations. So I apologize for my cold, and I'm very excited to hear your questions and any feedback you have. I just want to invite my co-author, Shannon, up here as well. And I'll just ask you to grab a microphone if you have a question. Yeah, your encounter data goes up to 2012. Do you expect those uh, lines to go up uh, for 2013 and 2014? You know, we're not sure. Um, there is some 2013 data coming in. It came a little bit behind our analysis, but we do hope to look at that. And if we do see anything, we could imagine putting something else out. Uh, I actually had a question here. I know you guys have done research on like the healthcare, but I was wondering if you knew about the diseases that are facing the jail population and are those at a higher rate than you know the local population, let's just say here in Sacramento. Yes. Um, so we do know, again, as Mia mentioned, that a lot of this is based on more of the national research for, for a broader criminal justice population. But yeah, particularly among infectious disease, um, tuberculosis and hepatitis are, are much high, have higher prevalence among correctional populations. Um, there's some work out of RAND, and they've looked more at the Cal California's parolee and prison population, and they see higher rates of, of those infectious diseases there. Um, also chronic conditions, asthma and hypertension, there are higher prevalence rates among, again, a lot of this is based on the broader criminal justice population, so in some cases perhaps not just specifically the jail population, but to the extent that those are probably overlapping groups, we, we, we do see higher, higher rates of illness among, among those in, in, in jail. Sorry. Hi. Um, so do you know yet if uh, of any counties in California that are enrolling uh, their inmates or, or <coughs> helping them enroll? And if so, do you know if there's any, um, any difference between them enrolling men versus women? The last, the last part of your question is really a good one. I hadn't thought to pursue that. But I have been meeting with counties this past week, actually, because um, that's something we're really trying to learn about. So what are your efforts? How, do you, how are you approaching this strategically? Are you designating an entity? many individuals that can help with this process is someone overseeing it and pursuing it. And it does seem to be the case thus far that there are initiatives underway. We're in the very early stages. So, you know, there's a little bit of a buildup. Um, but I do expect we'll start to see enrollment in the second half of this year. And we're hoping to be able to pick that up. I'll just also mention that because maybe we're in the Bay Area and in San Francisco, the, the San Francisco Sheriff has, has made Kind of you know in the in the press we read about him kind of being very interested in, in pursuing opportunities for en enrolling medical i'm not sure what exact and we'll hopefully learn more about what that means in practice but at least in terms of being open to this opportunity i think both san francisco and alameda have have at least shown 
some indications that they are, you know, actively wanting to to pursue things. And so, as Mia mentioned, you know, as this goes on, we'd like to learn learn more about what they're doing and, and others. Uh, um, the entities of the counties are designating. Are, are they the county eligibility workers or some part of that? And if so, given the huge backlog that they have, it doesn't seem to be going away at all quickly. How, how does this even work? That's a huge challenge. It's also a challenge at the state level. Um, you, and typically, the entity would be someone between the individual and the eligibility worker. So someone to help with the filling out of that application <coughs> and sort of moving it through the process. Thank you. I'm wondering if AB 720 has the same effect um, on the prison population as it does on the jail population. Uh, are inmates in, in state or federal prison allowed the same, um, you know, that same help with eligibility, you know, and all of that? It's, it applies to the jails system and to the counties, but there are similar efforts underway at the level of the state prison system, and they do face similar, you know, Prior to ACA, very few people were eligible for Medicaid. And so they had efforts in place to get those who were eligible enrolled, but now we have a much larger population and it's sort of a question of how fast can those efforts be ramped up. And, and to the extent that both the state, I think, and some local jurisdictions um, had the opportunity to take advantage of, uh, they often call it the early Medicaid or Medi-Cal expansion. We did hear through the low-income health programs that were run at the county level, there is some some efforts that have been underway under that. It's, it's different with Medi-Cal, but still kind of that, that movement in, in both of those systems in, in certain circumstances could kind of help move this, move this along as well. Um, to what extent have, is there evidence that the, dis, the sort of sicker the inmates are that gets reflected in the communities that they're released to? Does that sort of, the, do they bring back infectious diseases with them, that sort of stuff, and is that born out in the in the data there's a literature that looks at this at a lar at a higher level than the California counties and there is some evidence of the transmission of particularly infectious diseases so I think uh, one way to think about this is preventing the spread of infectious disease usually through diagnosis and management and then better management of chronic conditions so they may be managed in the jail system and then not so well managed outside the jail system, and so trying to improve the continuity of care. Yes, as far as the, uh, the eligibility issue is concerned, um, it is true that ACA provides a great expansion because people are now eligible for uh, Medi-Cal regardless of their, uh, the, the, the state of their disability or, or, or necessity for treatment. However, is it not still the case that within that group there are still distinctions uh, uh, on, in the level of care people receive based on the nature of their, how, how chronic and how severe their conditions are? Uh, and in that case, with respect to the, uh, to the seriously mentally ill, uh, you still have the issue of making sure that people are adequately diagnosed, the level of functioning is assessed, and that there are procedures in the jail to ensure that those people are actually uh, identified uh, among the many, I mean, you qu quoted a figure of 50 percent of people with mental health needs, but I'm sure the, the figure of people with serious mental illness, the predicate for case management services and so forth, is, is closer to the 10 to 14 percent uh, level that, that one of your figures represented. That's yeah. Oh, I, I, was, I think your question points to a, a, to a good issue that a lot of what we're talking about through ACA and AB 720 really is about extending insurance coverage. Insurance coverage doesn't necessarily guarantee access to you know, the range and amongst different groups, it, they, they could have better or, or less access. And when you talk about particularly, say, mental health or the substance use side, provider capacity and differences in that across across counties, and then also people's ability to get connected to those services will likely will likely vary. So I think that's a, it's an important point to make that we're talking about insurance coverage, which we do know facilitates better access, but it doesn't guarantee access and that could, that could be different different across yeah. groups and, and throughout different regions in the state. And I would just add, you know, for a long time, jails have been siloed as health care providers. Many of the individuals they treat didn't receive continuous health care elsewhere prior to coming into custody. But as more and more people become enrolled in Medi-Cal, more and more people will have 
health histories that are established. And one of the key challenges will be sharing that information across health and jail systems. You've alluded to different regions, any distinct rural versus urban uh, differences, ability, capacity to respond, adapt, seize opportunities? We anticipate there will be. Um, our next stage is to move into some deeper county work. So this first stage is just sort of looking at it from the state level uh, on a statewide basis. Um, but in talking with counties, there are some key challenges in rural counties, and one of them is around reentry and finding ways for people to access services, even if they have coverage. Are there enough providers, and are there providers located where the individuals who need the treatment are? That's a big challenge. So any other questions or comments? Um, as we move towards more like alternative sentencing, it, does this, um, does 720 apply to those people who come through alternative sentencing and end up in a different type of program? Are we enrolling those people through ACA as well? Well, there's sort of different key points of enrollment. So one key point is when you enter jail custody, which even if you receive an alternative sentence, almost I would say everyone comes through the jail custody system. They may have a short stay, um, but there's an opportunity there for front-end enrollment. And then many who end up sentenced to jail time will go through, and these are quite new in many counties, um, reentry pod or transition unit type scenarios, and that's another point of enrollment. So we hope to catch people in either, at either stage, depending on how long they're there. So for the counties that are doing enrollment, uh, are they able to use the online application process or are they still using the, the paper forms for the Medi-Cal application, do you know? That's a good question. That's a good question um, and I don't think we, we do know yet. We, um, don't, we don't know, but um, they are not actually, so let's say there's an entity within the sheriff's department that's going to manage enrollment. They would manage to the point of handing over that application. So whether it be paper <coughs> or an online application, they wouldn't actually be able to process it. If that's um, Martha Guerrero with Los Angeles County. My understanding is the sheriff's department would um, coordinate with the local medical enrollment and eligibility system, mm -hmm. um, and work together to enroll that individual. Um, there are partnerships in place um, in some counties in our county, for example, um, where we can provide general assistance and, and uh, other mm -hmm. support. So I think those counties that have those relationships in place um, made a smoother transition. Definitely. I actually just met with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department yesterday, <laughs> and we talked about just this issue. So they are trying sort of a multi-pronged approach. They'll have people working within the jail system in the general population, but at this stage, they're really focused on the transitioning population. So people will, who will be leaving custody in about 45 days, making sure that those individuals are enrolled. And they have about five people within the system working on making that enrollment happen, but then they're hoping to reach to the broader population in the near future. Hi, I have a question about split sentences. So in counties where they're employing a lot of use of the split sentence where an offender will serve part of their time incarcerated in a jail and then um, community-based programs, mm -hmm. will Medi-Cal cover the community-based programs if it's uh, mental health treatment or substance use disorder? They should, I mean, outside of custody, they should be able to pull down some reimbursements for Medi-Cal. I mean, there are rules in terms of what providers can be reimbursed, and so there is still that process. But as long as it is outside of the, the jail setting or the institutional setting, there should be opportunity for, for claiming Medi-Cal reimbursement. But again, there are, there are other things in, in kind of having providers have that ability. But yes, that, that should be the case in an out-of-custody out of setting. And how is this working for veterans who are part of the, the correction system? And does VA do any reimbursement for them for their health care? 
That's a good question. You know, I've, as I've been traveling around to counties, there's been a lot. They seem to manage the veterans population in a specialized group relative to the general population. Um, but I do need to learn more about the relationship between county costs and veterans care. Yeah, and I'll, I, I, it's a good question, and I'll, I'll need to look more into how those two systems are, uh, can interact. Excuse me, the, the Veterans Administration has a special program that they've been trying to hook up with the various county jails to, to enroll veterans in, in health care services who are in jail. That's great. Uh, not all counties have, uh, have, have made those connections. Some counties are too small, the population are too small, but they do have a special program for that, to, for that purpose. That's great. Thank you. Are counties treating pre-sentence and post-sentence inmates differently in this regard? Well, it depends their main path for enrollment. So if it's at the time of booking, early on in the custody, then they would be treated similarly. Um, but if it's in a transitionary unit, then that's typically just for sentence inmates. So you're sort of at the end of serving your sentence. And so that's a trade-off in terms of who you capture. Well, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our email addresses are not actually on the slide. <laughs> but um, my on our website, I have cards so. up here. We'd love to hear any feedback you have or thoughts. We're really at the early stages of developing this research design, so we really appreciate your feedback and comments. Thank you.